Hi everyone and welcome to another revision session. This time we're going to focus on medicine in modern Britain, by which we mean from 1900 to the present day. Now if you do have it, you could match this up to your knowledge organiser number four for the medicine period. And what we're going to look at is modern ideas about treatments, preventions and care. And we're also going to focus on a case study, which is lung cancer. Now, here's the key point that you need to be aware of. We can say this, the modern period was a time of rapid change in medicine. Now, why was that? Well, firstly, it's because institutions, particularly the government, become increasingly involved in the medicine and health of its population. So, for example, laissez-faire ideas, where it's believed that governments should not intervene in people's lives, begin to end. And we can also see as an increase in the understanding of the link between germs, DNA and lifestyle improves, that action is badly needed. And lastly, we can also say that government action in the 1800s, although limited, did make a difference. And so many governments are encouraged to continue this in the 20th century. We can also say that war is a factor. There are famously some large wars in the 20th century, and these often lead to new injuries due to new weapons, and that results in greater practice and understanding for surgeons. Particularly, we can also say this, during World War II, the British public become used to the government helping them keep healthy and fit, and so they want that to continue after the war ends. Thirdly, we can also say that science and technology play a role in this rapid change. The 20th and 21st centuries sees greater cooperation between scientists. We call this big science. And this is not just scientists in Britain, this is scientists all around the world. This leads to greater understanding of things like DNA and lifestyle benefits. And it's aided by technological advances which aid research techniques and communication. Lastly, we can say this. Large profits were to be made as large drug companies begin to emerge. So industry is a factor. And many of these industries are building off government funding that allows new techniques to be developed. What about ideas about disease? Well, firstly, we can say this. The link between lifestyle and health has improved. So for example, it's common knowledge now that smoking is not good for you. In fact, specifically, it's linked to things like high blood pressure, lung cancer, and heart disease. And we're also aware that unprotected sex is now linked to sexually transmitted infections, such as HIV and AIDS. We're also better at diagnosing illness. That's largely due to better technology, which means we're more effective at doing this. So for instance, x-rays allow doctors to see inside the body without being intrusive. The same can be said for MRI scans that allow doctors to study internal organs. And lastly, we can also monitor heart activity using an electrocardiogram or ECG. Thirdly, Ideas about disease have changed because now doctors know about DNA and genetics. And so we are aware that microbes do not cause all disease. It may be linked to your family history. This means that some diseases are hereditary. An example of these could be Down syndrome and cystic fibrosis. What about treatment of disease? Well, in part, this has improved because of equipment. So for example, high-tech medical and surgical equipment is now used. So here you can see radiotherapy and then chemotherapy, which are both used to shrink cancerous tumors. We also have things like dialysis that can wash a patient's blood for them when their kidneys can't. And we also have keyhole surgery that reduces scarring during operations. Now remedies is a little bit trickier because although there are improvements in remedies, we are now facing new diseases. 
which means new remedies need to be discovered. And we're also aware that some diseases have become resistant to drugs, such as MRSA. We're also aware that despite the fact remedies might be improving, you cannot cure someone's lifestyle factor. That's a personal choice. And therefore, we still see some alternative medicines and herbal remedies being used and we still see some superstitious beliefs, but that's very much limited compared to earlier periods in history. Now, we will talk about drugs as well, but that will come later. What about prevention of disease in modern medicine? Well, there are several key measures that have been made to make sure that people remain healthy and do not get sick. Government health campaigns are a large part of this. This is essentially education that promotes healthy lifestyles and diets and it warns people about unhealthy practices. For instance, it's common to see advertising or educational campaigns that focus on giving up smoking or reducing your fat intake. Governments have also been using quarantine. This was particularly true during the Ebola crisis of 2014-15. Here, the British government warned against travel to West Africa, they tracked travellers to these nations, and they quarantined those who were a risk to other people. We've also seen the continuation of public health measures. These are laws that have been passed to ensure the health of citizens. So, for instance, in 2006, the Health Act banned smoking in workplaces so that passive smoking would not be a problem. And we've also had the Clean Air Acts of 1956 and 1968 that reduced air pollution, known as smog. Lastly, we've also prevented disease through mass vaccination programmes. These have been compulsory and funded by taxation. This has resulted in some major diseases, such as polio, being eliminated from the United Kingdom. Now, I said we talk about drugs. Specifically, we need to know about antibiotics and penicillin. You need to know about Alexander Fleming's work from 1914 to 1928. You can see him pictured here in the top right hand corner of your slide. Now, before Fleming's work, two developments were key. Robert Koch's work in the 1870s and 1880s discovered the specific microbes that caused specific diseases. Louis Pasteur's work in the 1880s proved how vaccinations worked by producing antibodies. However, by the time of Fleming's work, there were still significant problems. Scientists had discovered magic bullets, but Magic bullets like Salvation 606 and Prontosil often had nasty side effects. And we also were aware, and so was Fleming, that there were some microbes that were untreatable. For example, the Streptococci and Staphylococci microbes often resulted in soldiers during World War I dying of infection rather than their wounds. It's this that inspires Alexander Fleming to find a solution. Now, there is an element of luck here, as the penicillium mould does blow through his laboratory window. Fleming, however, does use this piece of luck to develop three key things. Firstly, by 1928, he realises that penicillin kills the streptococci and staphylococci microbes. He also works out that you can dilute penicillin to make a harmless cure. And he writes about this in a medical journal. However, by 1928, Fleming has some limitations because he only suggests injecting penicillin into the body. He never tries this himself. And this is largely because he cannot make enough of it and so gives up on the idea. Now, the story of antibiotics is continued 10 years later by Howard Florey he's the bottom left of your picture, and Ernst Chain in the top right from 1938 to 1941. Two key improvements are made by these individuals. Firstly, they solve the problem of supply 
by developing a freeze-drying technique to make penicillin more quickly. And they are also the first individuals to test penicillin to show that it can be injected into humans to cure infections. How do they come to this position? Well, firstly, communication helps because both Florian Chain read Fleming's article in the medical journal in the 1930s. We can also say that governments help them. Florian Chain are based in Oxford and the British government do give them some funding to carry their work out. However, it's really the American government that fund their work significantly, giving them money to fund five years of research. Lastly, we can also describe them as having individual brilliance. Florian Chain grow penicillin and hospital bedpans just to prove it can cure septicemia. And it's in 1941 they do this with a patient called Albert Alexander. Unfortunately, Alexander still dies because they run out of penicillin, but they've done enough intervention to prove that penicillin can cure infection. So, after 1941, this problem of supply is solved because we have the mass production of penicillin. How does this result? Well, again, communication plays a role because Florian Chain traveled to the Americas and in 1941, they convinced companies in the United States of America to produce penicillin. These companies are able to do that because the US government gives companies $80 million after the American nation joins World War II. Lastly, we can say that US companies using these loans set up huge factories so that freeze drying can be used to make penicillin on a mass scale. We've also mentioned DNA and genetics. This plays a crucial role in our understanding of disease today. Because beforehand, scientists knew that microbes cause disease, but they did not know disease could be inherited. Once DNA was discovered, in 1953 the structure of DNA is also discovered. It's a famous double helix shape and you can see a picture of it there in the top right hand corner. Further work is done to map the entire human genome and this takes place from 1990 to 2000. In fact, this is an example of big science. Scientists internationally working together and this allows us to understand the function of all the genes in our DNA. This is important because now we can understand the cause of genetic diseases. And it means that we can screen people who may be at risk. And then it also means we can take preventative measures. So for example, if you are screened and deemed to be at a high risk of developing breast cancer, you could have a mastectomy to remove the breast tissue so that it does not develop in you. However, there are still limitations to this. Although the structure of DNA was discovered in 1953, that leads to no improvements in medicine and health immediately. And then today, we can recognize harmful genes, but we're unable to treat them, edit them, or alter them. And that could be a way that medicine goes in the future. What leads to the discovery of DNA? Well, teamwork plays a large part. Scientists working together to A, discover the structure of DNA, but B, also to map the human genome. As we said, this is big science. And that's aided by technology. Really, in this case, that's the internet and computer databases that allow scientists to share their findings. We also must talk about the National Health Service if we're going to look at modern medicine. Now, why was it set up? Well, initially, there was a National Health Insurance Program that was set up in 1911. This was a step forward, but it did not cover the elderly, children, housewives, and even those who were unemployed. And so, in the early 20th century, care was still given in the family you wouldn't necessarily visit a doctor. By the time the NHS is set up in 1948, 
We now have a system in this country where hospital care and treatments are completely free. That includes vaccinations and screening, as we mentioned, for DNA. And it has also led to our hospitals being centres for training and research. This has led to some significant impacts. Three are listed here. One short term impact is that access to healthcare improved. More people visited doctors as it was free. And in the long term, and this was a focus of the NHS, women's health has improved significantly. And it's also led to high tech medical equipment and surgical technology being used. However, it hasn't all been positive. There are some limit limitations. For instance, hospitals were not improved immediately after the NHS was set up. And early on in the 1950s, prescription charges had to be given as well to help fund the health service. Lastly, we can also say this. If access to healthcare has improved because it's free, that has meant more visits, which also does mean greater waiting times. Why was it set up? Well, we mentioned right at the start that World War II made British people used to the idea that the government would look after them in terms of their medicine and health. So that plays a role. We can also say that government plays a role as well, and in particular two individuals, William Beveridge, who writes his Beveridge report, arguing for a health service in 1942, and Anurine Bevin, the Labour health minister in the 1940s and 50s, who introduces the National Health Service in 1948. Lastly, you need to know about lung cancer. We can say this, before better technology emerged, lung cancer was diagnosed using x-rays. This often led to incorrect diagnoses as abscesses were mistaken for tumours or far worse, cancer was mistaken for something less threatening. Now we have better diagnosis and that's largely due to technology such as CT scans that can check for cancerous cells or we can deliver a bronchoscopy which takes a sample of cells for testing. If you have lung cancer, we now have operations that can remove tumours and we can even transplant, which means that cancerous cells are replaced by healthy ones. As we've seen before, we also have radiotherapy and chemotherapy to shrink any tumours. But we've also come at it from another angle, which is prevention. Lung cancer can be caused by smoking. And so in 2007, there was a ban of smoking in public places. And there was also a ban of any tobacco sales to under 18s. You've also probably never thought about it, but in 2005, cigarette advertising was banned. And you do not see advertising for cigarettes on TV or radio or billboards because of this. Lastly, we've also increased the taxes on tobacco so that smoking is increasingly expensive. Now, how does this look in terms of using this information to answer a question? Well, one example is this explain question that says this, explain why there was so much progress in treatment of disease during the 20th century. You may use the following in your answer, magic bullets, World War II. What you could do is you could try and plan three paragraphs in order to answer this question. And bear in mind that each paragraph needs a specific structure. We recommend you make a point that answers the question, that you then give evidence and explanation, and then you link that point back to the question, which if you remember is, why is there so much progress in treatment of disease? If you have a go at that, then you could also have a go at writing this and you'd need to do it in less than 15 minutes to be ready for your exam. Thanks for watching the tutorial. Remember, there are plenty more tutorials on our YouTube channel.